evening. I am Katie Kuhn, the Manager of Chapter and Member Engagement for ACR. I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2019 Chapter Town Hall. I'll be turning the presentation over to our two presenters, Dr. McGinty and Dr. Thorworth, shortly, but I wanted to do a bit of housekeeping before we get started. First, I would like to recognize the Committee on Chapters, which is led by Dr. David Boyd for their hard work and continued support of the ACR Chapter Program. There are also some chapter news and events that I would like to highlight before we get started. First, the chapter recognition awards were due last night, and we had a record-breaking participation of 41 chapters. The chapter recogni recognition awards ceremony will take place at ACR 2019. Second, the chapter leaders workshop will take place on Saturday, May 18th from 12 to 430. Registration is now open and is open to all chapter leaders, counselors, alternate counselors, and chapter members. If you have any questions about the chapter, chapter leaders workshop, please feel free to reach out to the chapter team. For tonight's chapter town hall, please remember that this is your session and we hope you'll ask questions and participate in that way. We're going to hold questions until the end. However, if something comes up as we're going through the slides and you have a question, you have two ways to submit. Either type your question in the question box or submit a chat message. We'll put those questions in a queue to be addressed at the end. We will also invite you to raise your hand at the end of the session and we can unmute you so that you can ask your question directly. Last but not least, this session is being recorded so that the information will be available after the session is over. We are happy to have Dr. Geraldine McGinty, Chair of the ACR Board of Chancellors, and Dr. Bill Thorworth, Chief Executive Officer of the ACR, to present the 2019 Chapter Town Hall. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. McGinty to begin. Thank you so much, Katie, and I'd like to thank you and uh, the Committee on Chapters under Dr. Boyd's leadership for all of your hard work uh, on behalf of our chapters. And uh, it's a real privilege to speak to you all tonight. Uh, Katie, can everyone see my screen now? Yes, they can. Terrific. So, you know, unlike many professional organizations, we have a representative governance structure. And as you all know, that starts with our chapters. And it has been truly one of the great privileges that I've had as an ACR volunteer leader to spend time uh, visiting our chapters. And I see among the registrants, many of you who have provided with me with such a warm welcome, uh, people like Pat Lester and uh, Scott Harter and Mike Deveni. Um, and as I say, it's such a great opportunity to um, connect with mem our membership and really learn what are the issues that are important to you. So I'm hoping to go fairly quickly through some of the priorities that we're focusing on at the college and really hope that we'll have an opportunity to dialogue at the end. But always, please be in touch with me. You have my email address there. I'm always happy to be in touch uh, about specific questions. So um, this, as, as Katie said, this is your webinar, but this is also your organization. Uh, we have uh, four locations, our headquarters in Ruston. Um, we also are downtown in Washington, uh, where not much is happening these days. And we have our Center for Research Innovation in Philly. And of course, the Institute for Radiology Pathology, what some of us old folks know as the AFI, knew as the AFIP and continues to provide an incredible educational experience to so many trainees. And myself and Howard, uh, uh, great partners and very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to serve you all as chair and vice chair of the Board of Chancellors and to work closely with our colleagues, Tim Swan and Rich Duzak as the speaker and vice speaker. So our strategic plan is really what guides um, the work that we do. And um, we started this in, um, in 2014. We, always, we, we did our, our most recent strategic plan in 2014, but updated it again in 2017. And essentially affirms our core pro, uh, uh, purpose and has allowed us to establish priorities and set goals that can really focus our efforts. And I'm going to touch on, on activities in, in each of these. But our core purpose um, is this, and I think this is something we can align closely around. We're serving patients and society by empowering our members to advance the practice science and professions of radiologic care. And this, our goal, to be universally acknowledged as leaders in the delivery and advancement of quality health care. And you could say that that's aspirational, universally acknowledged. And I certainly think that, you know, looking back, we've had moments where perhaps we, we didn't have the um, the perception of our value among external stakeholders, but I feel as if we're in a really great place right now, and that has a lot to do with the important work that all of you do. But it is indeed a challenging world in which we live in. 
our workforce is changing, whether it's the fact that we're probably going to see a fairly significant number of radiologists retiring, or whether it's the different areas of focus and priority that we see from some of our younger members. Um, consumerism is rising. The idea that our patients um, are looking to know more about how they're spending their healthcare dollar, and, and appropriately so. We all want to have value for money. This oft-touted tra uh, transition from volume to value, which we've been hearing about now since well before the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, and, and, and yet still we're struggling how to, with how to really implement that effectively for radiologists. And then new disruptions in our marketplace, the consolidation that we're seeing among practices, the investment by private equity firms, something that is really um, changing the practice landscape and really making us think differently about how radiology services are, are provided and how radiology is governed in terms of our practice models. So sometimes it certainly feels um, like a stressful time to be in practice. Um, we hear continuously about uh, the opportunities and the challenges that artificial intelligence will provide, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we think that's going to look like for us, what it'll mean for radiologists, where will it take our profession. Um, we continue to try to de develop new tools and think about new relationships. I'll talk a little bit more about some of these, but um, certainly, you know, the, the, the burden of investing in informatics and uh, quality management infrastructure is certainly something that is can be very challenging we know for especially some of our smaller practices and that's a very significant imperative for us to continue to support um, those practices and our, I will just um, allude to the very active commission we have under Bob Pyatt's leadership for our general small emergency and rural practices um, this is very important to us so the strategic plan we hope allows us to move forward confidently to support you all, uh, it's a member organization. So let's start by talking about some of our priorities in terms of member and member engagement. And the Engage platform has been up and running now for a couple of years under the active stewardship of Dr. Larry Liebscher. And the idea was we really wanted to promote a conversation among our members and listen at scale to the conversations that you're having and the things that are on your mind. And um, we did make a conscious choice not to have this be anonymous. I think um, my feeling is that it has been an incredibly civil and thoughtful conversation. Um, that said, I've certainly heard, and you may have seen this in my bulletin column, I've heard that there are some members who feel that they are not really able to comment freely there. That's something we're going to be talking about at our board meeting this weekend. Um, I will really feel personally that I failed if we don't enable the kinds of conversations that allow people to express opinions that are different from the mainstream. Um, but, you know, I think, as I say, our members have shown themselves to be the collegial and supportive community that we've always known that they are. Um, and there are many communities there, um, the open forum, obviously, for everyone. But then we've also, I think, enabled um, certainly enabled some of the state chapters, and I know, uh, hope many of you have your own community, the, the council steering committee, and then some affinity groups. So uh, definitely a lot of possibility with this tool. In terms of making our organization more welcoming to all of our members, um, actions like offering childcare at our annual meeting, I'm very proud that we did that, and we'll be doing it again this year. Please, please publicize that at your own state chapter meetings. Um, I know that uh, moms and dads have to plan these things well in advance, but we really want to make sure that everyone knows that we're offering this, as well as lactation facilities. And we continue to um, look for ways that we can increase the diversity of our profession. Uh, we're very proud of our scholarship program for underrepresented minority medical students, uh, where they do a radiology um, internship, research internship in the summer after first year and go on then to have an, uh, an ongoing mentoring relationship through boards and interviews. And uh, we're hoping that we'll see many of those choosing radiology at the end. Um, I think of diversity in a very expansive way and um, very, uh, I'm very focused on maintaining the diversity in our leadership uh, in terms of practice type and continuing to include private practitioners. I'm somebody as is Howard and Rich Duzak who was formerly in private practice and now in academics. And I will say appreciate the flexibility that my wonderful department chair and colleagues give me, but really important that we continue to have active private practitioners, people like Bob Pyatt, people like Catherine Everett on our steering committee, and then um, you know our leaders, uh, Larry Muir is somebody who certainly is a great advisor for me, um, and uh, making sure that we continue to have all those voices in the discussion is important. 
Um, if you haven't heard a conversation about burnout in healthcare, then I, you're probably living in a cave uh, and maybe not so burnt out. Um, we had this was the focus of our interest society meeting last summer, and we had some really great discussions among the the people there and some some really I think terrific data driven um, uh, discussions. We're scientists. I think we we tend to to like to think about data driven solutions. Uh, I'm very happy to say that the college will be funding uh, a wellness tool assessment tool for members um, this year. Um, this is a very um, uh, evidence-based and well-regarded tool that came out of the Mayo Clinic. This is something we take extremely seriously. I am horrified to think uh, when I hear about suicides among trainees in radiology um, and just having people not uh, be able to experience the joy that I know we can all get from our practice and the reasons that we chose radiology. Uh, definitely want to focus a little bit on what our work on payment models and if you recall Imaging 3.0 was about making sure that the rest of the healthcare community understood the value that we could deliver um, and really supporting our community in driving more patient-centered uh, care, but also understanding how we could influence the payment system to incentivize that kind of care. A lot of our efforts since 2015 have focused on the macro legislation and the quality payment program uh, that emanated from that. Uh, we had an excellent webinar um, last Thursday Rich Heller, Lauren Golding, and Greg Nicola. You could not have three more knowledgeable people. So uh, that's available. I believe it's already on the ACR's YouTube channel. And if you're having difficulty finding it, just be in touch. Um, we realize this program is complex and it's challenging. I, I think we have some wonderful tools on the ACR website to support you in understanding how to, um, how to succeed. We've been talking about decision support for a long time. Um, the PAMA legislation was passed in 2014, and finally we have confirmation from Medicare that they are going to implement the program in 2020. So we have a year as a community to really knock the implementation of CDS out of the park. Um, we've been uh, already been doing some programming. Uh, Ash Malol uh, did this webinar a little while ago. Um, Zeke Silva did another one more recently. All of those are available on the ACR website. Um, another tool I just highlight, I'm sure many of you have heard of RScan. Uh, this is an educational program working with your referring physicians to help them understand what it means uh, to order more appropriately um, with some educational materials that they can use in between. Uh, our grant from Medicare to implement this was um, extended by a year but ends in October. We'll be folding the tools that we've developed into our clinical decision support registry so they won't go away. But you know, certainly, if you're looking to some, at something to do concretely with your referring physicians, this is this is one that I would highly recommend. Um, and certainly, um, we can give you more information. Speaking of practice models and disruption, as uh, yeah, as I did, um, I want to highlight some really important work that's being chaired by um, Howard Fleischon and Bob Pyatt, which is our corporatization task force. Um, it's no, I do not need to tell any of you that this is a rapidly evolving. Um, landscape. Um, our feeling was we wanted to survey that landscape. We've um, done so with the aid of Frost and Sullivan, which is an outside research firm, gotten broad stakeholder input across the entire practice landscape, and the group is now developing a white paper. And really, what we want to understand is what, what should the ACR uniquely do? How should we support members? And I would say especially our younger members in making choices about which practice to join and how to survive and thrive in this new world. Um, moving on to patient uh, radiology and patient-centered care, I do want to highlight um, the toolkit that the Patient and Family Centered Care Commission under Jim Rawson's leadership has developed and there's some really terrific resources in there um, you know, in terms of success stories, but also presentations and webinars. Um, one of the things that Jim Rawson, uh, when he was setting up the commission, and it was Bib Allen who, whose leadership established that commission, was he started articulating the crazy idea that we would have patients on all the committees. And guess what? You know, almost four years later, we have patients on all the committees, and it has been a wonderful addition to our work. Uh, we also now have patient editors on the board, editorial board of the J JACR. And it was one of those patient editors, Andrea Baronda Kitts, who recommended that we think about creating patient-friendly summaries of the appropriate use criteria. And it's it's a real goal to go from doing two things to our patients to doing things with our patients, to really that 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 
nirvana of shared decision making. And I don't want to in any way gloss over how challenging that is, but this is a terrific start for patients to be able to understand why we are recommending the test that we're recommending. And um, I think my goal, future goal for these, right now these sit on the JACR website, there's no password or, or required to access them, but uh, I doubt too many patients are spending time on the JACR website. So the question is, how can we take this incredibly valuable content now and make it even more available to our patients? Um, I, uh, when I was thinking about this role, um, I happened to have a conversation with um, Mark Bertolini, who was the former CEO of Aetna, and he talked about when you're in a leadership role that you have the power to set the agenda. And um, you know, while this is very much in line with our strategic plans, I will say that this has, is a personal priority for me, and that's increasing the penetration of lung cancer. I was on the team and I was Economics Commission Chair when we were able to convince Medicare to pay for lung cancer screening. As you all know, they said they'd pay for it, but they didn't say how much they'd pay for it. And what they're paying is pitifully low and not enough to really incentivize anybody to do more of it. But that's not the only problem because I know that we are a community that would really embrace screening. The problem is that the way the benefit is designed, it also requires the buy-in of our family practice colleagues and they have not been enthusiastic and have not supported this. So uh, at the moment we are, um, screening about 2% of the eligible population. And I have challenged our entire board, and I would challenge all of you tonight, that this is an opportunity for us to save lives. And I would love to see us doing better. 221,000 new cases of lung cancer annually. I And the research continues to build to show that we can actually make a real difference. So we have a, a, a cross commission effort at the college, um, thinking about this, um, but certainly anything that you can do to help us and, and, and help us how we how, talk about how we can move this needle would be greatly appreciated. I'm going to talk a little bit about external relationships. And, you know, this is about um, communicating what we are as a, an organization, but it's also about cooperating and collaborating with other societies. And we have a lot of opportunity to do that with the other radiology societies. And uh, those are very uh, warm and collegial relationships by and large. Um, but I wanted to highlight some conversations we've been having outside of radiology, which I think are interesting. Um, we've had a couple of meetings with the College of American Pathologists just to really understand where we may have opportunities to collaborate in the future. And, um, you know, it's interesting, our pathology colleagues are in a very different uh, place in their digital journey than we are. They're having the kinds of conversations that many of us remember from the mid-90s when we implemented our PAC systems about digitizing legacy images and managing workflow. and. Um, but I think we have a lot to learn from them in terms of how they have implanted, implant, implemented and embedded structured reporting in their culture. They've used incentives in their accreditation programs and their reports are by and large structured. And I know structured reporting is not the easiest topic. And for many of us, it feels a little uncomfortable. Remember, I'm a breast imager, so I've been doing structured reporting really all my professional life. Um, I know it's not quite as easy when you get into some other subspecialties, but um, certainly as if we're thinking about some of the tools that we want to enable uh, through our Data Science Institute, structured reporting is a really um, key underpinning of that. So I think we certainly have some things to learn from our pathology colleagues there. Uh, without wishing to be too chest thumping, I will say that when I we presented what we've been doing with data science, I think we blew them away. So that was nice to go with something we can be so proud of. But you know, really the, the, the question is, what, what are the opportunities that we have in the future to bring together radiology information, pathology information, genomics, to really give a, a holistic report? How do we manage that collaboration? How do we make it useful? So those are conversations that are um, ongoing. I don't have any particular timeline or, or deliverable, but really I think want you to know that we are reaching out to think about how we can shape our future in the best way possible for our patients. I'm going to talk a little bit about research. Um, I will say that as somebody who came up through the college as an economics nerd, um, it was a complete surprise to me the extent and the of the college's research operation and I think if you've read Dr. Hillman's um, blog post on that very topic um, he has made a really um, clear uh, connection between the research that the ACR 
sponsors and administers and also and then the, the practice innovations we would not have for example have been able to convince medicare to cover lung cancer screening if we hadn't had the national lung screening trial which the acr administered which showed a 20 percent mortality reduction so um you know, we have a very active uh center in philadelphia many collaborations across the country we have appointed a new chief research officer uh dr etta pisano who's a legend in my world as a breast imager um, and one of the things that Dr. Pisano uh, uh, is really tasked with is enabling those collaborations, supporting um, research in the radiology community, whether it's in academic or private practices. She is absolutely available to come and, uh, and speak. So please, if, if you are interested in having a world-class research mentor, um, you could not do better than ETA. Um, uh, I do, uh, I mentioned the NLST. I do want to highlight um, the Neiman Health Policy Institute. And um, this is something I think that by now is well known to all of you. They have done very credible uh, health policy research, but also supported us as a community with uh, tools that help us in our daily practice. And they have also supported our evidence-based advocacy. Um, you know, the, the uh, work that they did to show that CMS's policy of a multiple procedure reduction was really not based in any fact and was certainly not supported by CMS own methodology. That work was, was found foundational in our ability to convince Congress to roll that payment back. And that's been responsible for putting a lot of dollars back into the pockets of radiologists so we can continue to provide the high value care that we, that we want to to patients. So um, huge credit to um, our team at the Health Policy Institute. I'd like to highlight two exciting new relationships. Um, always looking for more evidence to show the outcomes that are associated with imaging. And uh, we've established a collaboration with Northwell Health, which is a large health system here in the New York area, um, to look at outcomes research. And that's that's just gotten up and running. And then we've essentially um, now located the uh, Health Policy Institute at the Georgia Institute of Technology. That's important because one of the challenges we've had has been recruiting and retaining um, talent, talented analysts, talented um, researchers. Um, in the DC area, there are a lot of other people competing for that talent. So, uh, and we're not necessarily able to pay the same salaries as some of the giants. And of course now Amazon's moving in. So, um, but citing uh, the Health Policy Institute in an academic community can really provide that support and that sense of community that that uh, folks who are looking to do research as a career are looking for. So we're really, we're excited about the collaboration in that community, especially around data analytics. Um, so we're looking forward to even greater things from the health policy to come. Um, data science is obviously one of the most um, exciting things that we're talking about. I think I, other people outside of our community are surprised to see us as radiologists optimistic and excited and curious and not panicking. Uh, there's a lot of hype out there for sure. Um, but you know, there's some real substance. Um, I think that uh, I like this quote. Many of you may have seen some of us present it. I don't think we're going anywhere. We're still, um, we're still gonna be an integral part of this. Um, but we are, as we've been trying to be very thoughtful about what it is that we're trying to achieve with our Data Science Institute, which isn't even two years old and has really accomplished so much. Yes, we're unapologetic about ensuring the value of radiologists because we think we're critically important. We, unlike any other stakeholder in this ecosystem, have patients, have a sacred oath to our patients. So we are all about protecting our patients. But that said, we understand that um, you know we have to work with the other stakeholders. We have to you know understand what's happening at Google and understand what's happening at that little sta uh, startup um, down the street. So managing those, and also we have to make sure that we're connecting with the people who are going to be regulating and paying for this. And we do do feel that we have a huge imperative to educate the community. And I think especially educate the community actually outside radiology. Um, this time last year, I was speaking at the nuclear medicine meeting and uh, a physician came and said that his daughter had been told by her medical school dean not to go into radiology because um, she was gonna get replaced by a robot. Well, needless to say, we were on that one like a shot and 
uh, she's now going into radiology. She came to the ACR annual meeting. So um, we are not going to let that happen. But one of, the, one of the things that we've been talking about as we speak about the possibilities of data science is this really important ecosystem because there is no, we can't do it on our own as the, as the ACR. Radiologists can't do this as their own or certainly can't compete with $4 trillion of market cap that's Facebook, Amazon, IBM, and, and, uh, and GE and Google. Um, so, but if we don't work together, we do risk getting this wrong and missing this opportunity. And I think we've seen a couple of missteps, the high profile um, investment at, at uh, MD Anderson and also across the street from me at, at Memorial where we've invested money. We haven't come out of it with what we were hoping to. If we, you know, we, we don't have people in lockstep, there's a lot going on in a lot of different places and it's not necessarily clear who's going to drive this forward. We feel we have a very important role as the ACR, as a trust, certainly as a trusted arbiter for our patients, but also as a convener um, to help with development of standards, validation of algorithm, and monitoring of these algorithms once they are out in practice. So I'm, we couldn't be prouder of the work that our Data Science Institute has done under the leadership of Keith Dreyer and Bib Allen and their mission to advance data science as core to clinically relevant, safe, and effective radiologic care. So I've talked to you a lot about what we're doing and um, I'm hoping that we will have some opportunity to talk about what the future holds. But I have to say that when I think about what the future holds, I have to say that I look to all of you and you have shown your leadership time and time again. So you know, when we think about what we're trying to do with research and we focused our foundation on um, on health policy research, really trying to move our specialty forward by demonstrating the value of what we do and understanding how to increase that value. So I have to congratulate and, and, and sincerely thank the practice leaders and chapter leaders who contributed in our um, most recent fundraising drive to, to the work of the foundation. And, you know, I think what this shows me is we have people from private practice, we have people from academics working together, um, you know, to advance our profession. So you are shaping our future in that way. One of our core values, or one of the words in our in our goal, is leaders, um, leadership, and our Radiology Leadership Institute, um, founded in 2012, continues to evolve to really support leadership training at every level, um, you know, at the pivot points in your career, whether it's your first job, whether it's being a mid-career leader that just got your first, you know, seat on the hospital board, or whether it's a senior leader who's really thinking about managing some of these significant disruptions in the marketplace. So again, I have to thank you guys, you all, for shaping our future, and thank all the state chapters who support their members to attend our, our Radiology Leadership Institute planning. Um, uh, if you haven't had a chance to come to the RLI Summit in September, it is a truly trans, I actually was speaking this afternoon with uh, one of the fellows, the abdominal fellows at the University of Pittsburgh, who's developed a very cool tool with Alexa to uh, help in the reading room. He talked about coming to the RLI Summit as uh, uh, sponsored by the Pennsylvania chapter and it really being a transformative experience for him. So you are shaping our future. You are creating the leaders of the future and truly an inspiring, um, an inspiring effort and many of you I know are involved in it. And you are reaffirming your commitment to our organization, to our broad community. The, the system that we have of chapters and the central ACR, the um, representative governance that really starts in the chapters, um, so important. So thank you to all of you who have signed your ACR affiliation agreement. And then as we think about you know, making our uh, organization more reflective of the patients we serve, more diverse, we, we continue to hear about diverse teams making better decisions. And that's clearly what we want for our organization. So I want to thank the following state chapters for their commitment to diversity. Um, and I, I think this list is getting updated all the time. I also want to uh, sincerely thank Dr. Gail Morgan, who's one of our uh, volunteer leaders in the Commission on Women and Diversity, who's really been um, instrumental in supporting chapters in this work. Um, and we continue to, to work with additional chapters. 
Um, I'm always reminded that Bill Harrington used to talk about the struggle to make the council steering committee more diverse because obviously the, the members he nominates have to be councillors. So your commitment to diversity is clearly important in uh, creating that leadership pipeline. So once again, it is our state chapters who are creating our futures. Um, uh, I'm often asked about my leadership philosophy. Um, this is not actually really me with Madame Curie, but wouldn't it be wonderful if it was? It's on the back porch of the Curie Institute where they have her uh, a figure of her that you can be photographed with. But I, I think this is a wonderful quote from her, which is, have no fear of perfection. You'll never reach it. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. And I, for me, I think it, it, um, it really characterizes us as a specialty. We are curious. We are innovative. We have never stood still. I think most of us are using technology every day that was not even invented when we went into practice. So I will leave you with um, a few thoughts on artificial intelligence, which I think is the thing that people thought we would fear, but we have we've embraced and we're, we're, we're you know, really seeking to manage, which is not about human versus AI. And I think it was Kurt Langlotz who said it's about, but it, it is that the radiologists and the humans who do not embrace the possibility of artificial intelligence may be replaced by those who do. Um, and I'll leave you with one last quote, which is um, Bib and I were interviewed by Wired magazine, uh, which, as many of you know, is a technology futurist magazine. And they asked, you know, what would you tell medical students who are thinking about radiology? And I would I said that, you know, I was thinking back to my own decision to do radiology, which was you know, really being excited about that intersection between technology and humanity. That if you want to be in the specialty that is going to most effectively harness AI for the benefit of patients, that is going to be radiology. So I will stop there. Uh, I'm hoping we have lots of questions. Thank you for listening. And uh, okay, Katie, let's see what do we have. Okay, uh, thank you again, Dr. McGinty. Um, again, to all the attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to either type them um, in your questions box or in your chat box, and we will read them off, as well as raise your hand um, and we'll be able to unmute your line. Um, Dr. McGinty, I do have uh, one question ready for you as well as one member who has raised their hand. So for the question, the first question we've received, um, they have asked if you would be willing to comment on the radiology certification by the National Board of Physician and Surgeons. Thank you, Katie. Um, so right now that's not one of the certifying bodies um, stipulated in the ACR bylaws. We recognize this is a very, um, active topic of discussion. It certainly has been on our engaged platform. Um, I'm not sure if the member who asked the question is aware. We did just submit comments on the ABMS vision document. So very much encourage uh, to take a look at that or also to take a look at the comments of the Council for Medical Specialty Societies. Uh, we endorsed those. We also sent our separate letter. Okay, thank you. Um, for the um, member who has their hand raised, um, Dr. Singer, I'll be unmuting your line so you may ask your question. Dr. Singer? Mm -hmm. he, he may have his computer or his phone uh, on mute. Okay, um, Dr. Singer, we will we'll come back um, in a moment. I, I do have one uh, question that I can read in the meantime. Um, Dr. McGinty, what is the most important issue that the ACR is tackling right now? Well, I think that we, you know, the priorities that we laid out um, are certainly all important to us. Um, you know, I think that if for me, it's really important that our members feel supported by the organization. Um, if I'm separating out a, um, an issue that be, is unique for the ACR, we are a member organization. That support takes many forms. It's, it's um, certainly supporting them in their personal wellness, but it's also making sure that the way that they are um, reimbursed and incentivized is conducive to them having a, 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 a satisfying practice life. Um, so I think all of our priorities um, are come around that, but um, you know take different forms. 
Okay, thank you. Um, the one more question I've received: Is there any update on the Anthem steerage issue, and are other insurance companies copying Anthem? So that's a great question, and thank you. Um, so Anthem essentially. Um, implemented many, many exemptions to that policy, um, which for those who may not have been as familiar, Anthem had a policy where they were steering patients away from certain types of facilities, um, notably hospital facilities. And um, you will recall that the ACR's position on this was that we believed excellent care could be provided in many settings, but that we thought it was never appropriate for an insurance company to be deciding where care should be provided, that that should be a decision between patients and their physician. Um, so as I say, M uh, Anthem essentially didn't roll back the policy, but implemented so many exemptions as to really render it um, uh, not, not, not as active. Unfortunately, United Healthcare has now decided to implement a similar policy. Uh, we have engaged with United Healthcare uh, specifically through the Massachusetts chapter, um, and we'll continue to do that um, with United on a national level. We have a um, uh, commercial payer um, subcommittee of the Economics Commission that, that is uh, taking that on. Yeah, Geraldine, this is Bill. I was going to mention that the Massachusetts uh, uh, United Healthcare program also was not a, uh, an actual uh, complete ban on. Uh, any given uh, location of service, but rather it was differential coverage, uh, so it was not quite as uh, draconian as the Anthem policy. Right. Thank you, Bill. Okay, we've received another um, question. Um, it states, as we try to move past six years of PAMA to CDS implementation, what is the evidence that full implementation is marginally more protective of RBMs or reimbursement cuts for imaging? More protective than RBMs, do you think, Katie? Is that? Um, it may be. It says okay. it's marginally more protective of RBMs or reimbursement cuts for imaging. Okay. I'm going to take a stab at this, and certainly if whoever asked the question doesn't feel like I got it right, please just drop me a note and we'll, and we'll work through it offline. Um, you know, we certainly believe that um, the evidence is building to show the benefit of, um, of clinical decision support. Some of the really lovely work that's come out, come out of the University of Virginia um, and their ability now to move past pre-authorization with carriers in their area suggests that we, you know, this is something that we can certainly use to drive uh, out uh, radiology benefit managers, and that's you know obviously aspirational, but certainly something we will we will continue to articulate as a goal. Um, and I think also um, the the quality of care is certainly something that I'm now I'm certainly using in my own negotiations to talk about more appropriate care. Um, in terms of preventing reimbursement cuts, um, I think this continues to be part of how we articulate our contribution to value-based care. Um, you know, when we talk about our commitment to um, driving appropriate imaging, um, and that's really separate from the programs in the macro legislation, although there's some recognition of clinical decision support, it's talking about radiologists as very much part of the solution and not part of the problem. Um, so we continue to believe that this is a strategy that um, strengthens us in radiology. Um, I wish that the implementation had been sooner, and it's been very disappointing to see some of our um, physician society colleagues outside of radiology who do nothing but complain about pre-authorization until we give them a solution that's evidence-based and at the point of care, and then they complain about that too. Um, but um, you know, the proof will be in the pudding, and again, that's why I think we feel so uh, strongly that this is an important year to make sure that we um, you know, are, are getting our referring physician uh, colleagues up to speed with what they're going to need to do to participate in the program. Okay, thank you. Well, this, that is, this, is, this is Bill. Yeah. I was just going to add one other one other comment. I think uh, part of the proof of the pudding is that there were 13 uh, reimbursement cuts from to the Deficit Reduction Act in 2005 up to uh, the passage of the PAMA uh, legislation, and there have been none since. So I do think that we have certainly quieted uh, the focus of uh, reducing reimbursement to diagnostic imaging as a way to control utilization. Great point. Thank you, Bill. 
Okay, we have not received any other additional um, questions. Um, so I just want to give everyone just another moment if they'd like to ask a question to please type it into the question box. It doesn't appear that we're getting any other additional questions. So um, again, I want to thank Dr. McGinty and Dr. Thorworth for presenting this evening, as well as to thank all of our chapter leaders who have joined us for the call. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will uh, we are recording this presentation, and we will um, be sure to share it with all of our chapter leaders um, later this week. So if you have any um, additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to the, the chapters team. Thank you, Katie. I'll just say um, I really appreciate everyone spending their evening with us this evening. Looking forward to seeing you all in DC in May. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night.